Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and if you know the book of Genesis, chapter 1, the glorious prose poem about God's creating the world, crescendoing with the creation of the first Adam, the first human being. You know you've read one of the greatest chapters ever written in the annals of human existence. Now, most interpretations of the word Adam is that the te text is speaking of a male, a man, that the first human being God creates in the Torah is a male. And most people who've never studied or read the book of Genesis believe that the first woman, whom they often call as Eve, although her name is never mentioned in the opening three chapters of the book of Genesis, most people mistakenly believe that the woman was created after the man and was created from the man's rib, which is, by the way, the way the second chapter in the book of Genesis tells the story. It's a different story. But not so in chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. For in chapter 1, where we read the prose poem of how God created the world in six days, in chapter 1, the text actually reads, And God said, let us make a human being in our own image. And God created the first human being, male and female. God created them. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, the poem describes how God creates both male and female together, each being created in the image of God. In a simple reading of the text, the message is clear and powerful. Both men and women are of equal divine essence of soul. Men and women are very different physically, anatomically, even emotionally, certainly sexually. Men and women may play different roles in a given society. But intrinsically, from the Jewish perspective, men and women are of equal divinity. Both are created in the image of God. Each is a sacred human being with the spark of the divine at the core of their soul, at the essence of their being and their humanity. That is a simple and obvious lesson in the plain reading of chapter 1 of the book of Genesis. But in the Jewish tradition, there are always deeper, hidden meanings, which are revealed through rabbinic commentaries to the text known as Midrash. And there is a Midrash through this description of the creation of the first Adam that transcends its time, transcends its social context, which carries a special relevance to our contemporary world. And the drash is this, that when God says, I'm sorry, that when the text says, God created the first Adam, both male and female, it is to teach that the first human being God created was both, was both a male and a female, with both physical genitalia and the emotional essence of both male and female. In the Midrash, the first person created by God was neither a male nor a female, but was in fact male and female. And from this Midrash, much of Jewish literature rejects the notion of the exclusivity of male and female gender. In Talmudic literature, the rabbis understood the complexity of gender, of sexual identity, 
and of the possibility that a person might be born with genitalia that do not reflect that person's soul or sense of self. This is not 21st century New York Times. This is Talmudic Judaism, which again teaches genitalia do not necessarily reflect a person's soul or sense of self. We tend to act as if the question of gender and the debate over whether gender is a binary issue or something more complicated, that it's a product of the contemporary world, not to the educated Jew. And while Jewish law and Jewish sociology has very definite rules for what it means to be a male or a female, the Jewish tradition has an extraordinary sensitivity to the complexity of sexual self-identity and the way in which people need to be honest about who they are in this complex, complicated, often very painful human existence called life. On this edition of L'Chaim, I am so honored to be joined by a most extraordinary and courageous and brutally honest Jew who's traveled a personal journey that few of us can understand from first-hand experience. It is my privilege to introduce you to Yiska Smith, author of 40 Years in the Wilderness, My Journey to Authentic Living, in which Yiska describes her transition from being an Orthodox member of Hasidic community, a husband, a father of six children, the transition to becoming a lovely, vivacious woman whom she is today. Yiska Smith is currently a highly respected Jewish educator, spiritual activist, teaching Jewish meditative practice and spiritual text at the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. And in addition to her book, 40 Years in the Wilderness, Yiska also is involved in a marvelous documentary film entitled, I Was Not Born a Mistake, which was part of the Haifa Film Festival. I am so thrilled to finally have you at this table. You know JBS has done tapings of you in some of the addresses you've done, but to have you here is an honor, and I want to, th you, you just got off a plane coming in from Jerusalem. Thank you for being here, and thank you for being at this table. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Did you feel my description was accurate? I felt that your description, uh, I wouldn't so much as use the word accurate as I would honest mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. genuine. Mm -hmm. And it also suggests the complexity yes. of gender identity yes. and the possibility for different ways of expressing whatever that means to mm. various people. Mm -hmm. It's open-ended rather than closed. Yes, isn't it? Well, that's what I appreciated about what you said. Oh, thank you. Um, by the way, you, the, the film you're involved with now, you told me a fascinating story about the title. Because you know JBS has taped you before. Yes. And tell that story. So a couple of years ago, I think I want to say maybe, I'd, you know, I do so much traveling. Right. <laughs> maybe three years ago, four years ago, I was invited to speak at a synagogue in New Rochelle, New York. And before I arrived, it was the rabbi or the organizer communicated to me that JBS would like to record it. Do I give my permission? And I said, of course, I'd be honored. And so I was being uh, filmed as I spoke. And then after my lecture, after my talk, which included some of my spiritual uh, expressions of my journey, some of the particulars, I uh, opened up the room to a Q&A, which I always love, because then I connect more with the participants in the audience. And one person asked me a fascinating question. 
he said to me, you seem to be such a strong believer in God and in really honoring the Jewish tradition and you're a Zionist, you live in Israel, you raised your children there and you've come back as Yiska to make a life there, blah, blah, blah. How do you feel, though, about God having made a mistake with you? And I looked right out into the room and I said, God, I was not born a mistake. I was not born a mistake. I was born with the same need to identify and then heal an imperfection that is divinely created in me as everyone else. Only everyone else, each person has a different, what we call in Hebrew, tikkun. So some of the uh, tikkun could be more obvious or more dramatic or more subtle or more inner or more outer. Translate tikkun for our uh, audience. So tikkun literally means, from the Hebrew, letaken, to fix. Spiritually, in terms of spiritual practice, what it means is to identify the one point inside of the person that we believe God created us with in order to improve to become more engaged in the relationship with God. In essence, co-creating our lives with our Creator. And this really comes out of Kabbalah. Yes. Not the Rabbinic tradition. Yes, this right? comes out of Kabbalah. Uh, however, more than just the, the Mukubalin, the Kabbalists, will say that if we were all created perfect, we wouldn't have been created. Okay. By the way, you have the right to disagree with anything I say at any time. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, no, no. I won't be shy. No, no. I know you won't. I'm uncomfortable with the word imperfection. I don't feel there was anything imperfect in the way you were, you were created. Imperfect suggests that there is a perfect, and you were, and there's something about you that wasn't right. In my own, in my own mind, the journey you took was, was. You, you were born the way you were born, and you were born well, divine, every, and, and, it, well, and you had to come, you had to learn, there were things you had to learn about yourself, and it's true, we all learn things about ourselves. Most people are not honest anyway, Yiska, but the people who are honest with themselves, they struggle with becoming. Okay, so you may say to me, you know, over time, and it, for you it took, I mean, you, this book is an amazing book. But you say it really isn't until you're 50 years old that you really begin to move... To do the tikkun. To do, to, yeah, to do what you call tikkun. Anyway, I'm telling you, I am uncomfortable with hearing you say about you, you were imperfect. Well, and, and I'm okay with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. And I want to explain that when I use the word imperfect, it's not a judgment. It's a fact of life. It's just like I was created and born with blue eyes. That's not good, that's not bad. What I meant by imperfect in Hebrew, the word is shlemut, to be complete. So I was born as you were born, as every human being is born with a part of themselves that they need in expressing b'chirach of shit, free will, to bring themselves to a more complete state. So if, if the listener or if yourself <laughs> feels more comfortable with incomplete, for, I, I don't mean it as a negative judgment against myself. It's a state of reality okay. that only the divine is perfect. Okay. All right. <laughs> we all have something. It's called in Hebrew, based in the Kabbalistic or the mystical writings, we all have a shlichut. We all have a mission. We all have a reason for being here. And whatever that reason is, the goal is the same. It's to redeem us from a state of not as complete or not as perfect to a state of more. And that's how we nurture and engage and express our relationship with the divine. Okay. And, and there's so much of your story that, that just... Uh, um, it's inspiring, and I use the word courageous as a courageous story. 
and I give you enormous a lot of credit, and I want to hear more about the details of it. In this particular area, you and I would use different language, okay. but I believe we are talking about something very, very, very similar. similar. Right. Okay. So what happened, just to complete the story, when the people who produced and wrote the documentary, when they, aside from getting to know me face to face in Israel, they researched me online, they came across this interview that the JBS recorded. It's on my website. And when they heard me say, well, I was not born a mistake, they said, ah, that's the name. Oh, that's, that's the name of the film. Yes, guys, a fabulous story. Yeah. Fabulous. All right. All right. I also said to you off camera, and I, I want you to understand, Yiska writes 40 Years in the Wilderness. In it, there are many of her own reflections on what Jewish life is. It has nothing to do with sexuality or gender or self-identity. It has to do with who the Jewish people are as we enter the 21st century, and it's a complicated Jewish life. And I found not only did I, was I taken by the story, the narrative that runs throughout. And she does it in sections of her life, and it's very powerful and very, very well written, sweetheart. That was wonderfully done. I had a great editor. Well, it helps, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it okay. does. Okay. But in addition, I find what she writes about Judaism. Yiska Smith goes to JTS, and she writes about the way in which studying at JTS, studying about Torah and God at JTS, is profoundly different from what it meant for her to study Judaism and to learn about God in Jerusalem. I'm correct? Oh, yeah, that was a FBM. Okay. So I'm just saying to you, if you're interested in a good read, you're reading two things at the same time, a very powerful personal journey, but you're also reading some very profound reflections on what Jewish life is. And I... There's so much I want to ask you about. But the first, I just Could have I to... just add one thing? Absolutely. You? This is why I say to audiences now that my journey was actually, if, if not more, at least as it was a st it's a story of a spiritual tikkun, mm -hmm. of really, I, I was grappling with the tension between my spirituality, Jewish tradition, and my own authenticity. That really is what the journey is about, the, the grappling when these three paths start to lock horns. And I wanted to honor Jewish tradition, honor my sense of spirituality, and honor and become more authentic. Okay. So we'll talk about the story a little bit. Okay. You're born Jeffrey. Yes. You're born where? Patchog, Long Island, New York. Who are your parents? Harold and Joan Smith. May my mom rest in peace. Do you have siblings? I have two siblings. Male, female, what? Two sisters. Two sisters. And you grew up, Jeffrey, and you yeah. live a life where you live, a, you're a Jeffrey, okay? And you well, just only to my mother I was Jeffrey. I was Jeff to everybody. Else. Okay, Jeff, fine. <laughs> it's a deal. Okay, you're Jeff. And ultimately you fall in love with Susan. Yeah, that was in college, yes. Right? Yeah. And you marry her. And you have six children with her? Yes. And you move to Israel? Yes. But when you move back and forth, you do a lot of traveling, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, as I read this book, and I'm reading the story, I'm going to use a word, and you can tell me I'm wrong. A lot of it feels as if you were tortured, that there was a torturous element to living the life you lived, even before you understood why, that you were, yes, you were in pain a lot. I was. You know, we have on Shabbat, in the silent prayer, in the Amidah, we have a phrase, We ask God to purify our hearts so we could work with you, be with you, serve you, be in relationship with you in truth. And as I'm saying those words, every Shabbat, Friday night, Shabbat morning, Musaf, the additional prayer, Shabbat Mincha, 
Four times I'm saying that every Shabbat. And in saying that, I know I'm not being honest. So yeah, there was, I did feel tortured. What complicated it for me, I don't want to play the victim card here, but my reality was I felt I was the only person suffering from this. The world I lived in, didn't, we didn't have a TV. There was no online community yet with, com with computers. So I, had no, I didn't have access to information outside of my, my own immediate environment. So I knew as far back as when I was around five years old that something's not really right here because I always felt I'm a girl, but yet my body's telling me I'm a boy. Yeah, so, talk, talk about that for one more moment. And I know you start in the book at five, and you, yeah. you talk about watching your mother put lipstick on, blah, blah, blah. You know, there are many children, boy children who, when they're very young, they dress up in their mother's clothing and they, and they even put lipstick on. What? I never I, did. What? I never did. But you felt like you wanted to. It's not that I felt I wanted to. I would, when I would gaze at that one incident that you're quoting, when I was gazing at her as she was preparing to go out with my dad for the evening, all I kept thinking is, I want to be just like her when I grow up. And I was in this trance where I really believed I could be just like her when I grew up. I never had a proclivity to dress up as a girl okay. or a all woman. Right. It's just my, she brought just her, her, her femininity, her dignity, her grace, and just the ease at which she was just that way. And you loved it. I loved it completely. And you did not feel the same way when you got, saw your father shave. Exactly. Okay. Um, by the way, this is an adult show. I hope I want to talk about sexuality to the extent to which you're comfortable doing so. At five years old, we're not sexual beings yet. This has nothing to do with it. Right. This is gender identity. Okay. They're worlds apart. They are worlds apart. Explain that to our audience. Explain how is gender and sexuality not the same? Not being a scientist and not being uh, a uh, professor with empirical study, I can only speak from my experience and other people that I know. Sexual orientation has to do with who I'm attracted towards being intimately involved with. Very well said. Gender identity has nothing to do with who a person is sexually attracted towards. Because you could also be bisexual. So you can be heterosexual, you can be bisexual, you can be homosexual, gay, lesbian. None of that, none of that is the same as when I look in the mirror and I'm by myself, who do I see? Do I see a man or a woman? Do I see a boy or a girl? At 7, 9, 10, 12 years old, I would look in the mirror every morning expecting to see a girl looking back at me. And I saw the body of a boy looking back at me. It had nothing to do who I was attracted towards. The fact that I realized I was attracted to be intimate with a man is because I felt I identified as a straight woman till today. Do you think your wife ever sensed that you were uncomfortable with your own body? Yes. You write about her as if she was a very good friend of yours. Yeah, I loved her. And she loved you. And by the way, life is complicated. That has all kinds of meanings. This was nothing, however, you could discuss with her. Oh, gosh, no. I couldn't even be honest with my therapist. And you knew what was going on. I knew exactly what was going on. But you could not articulate I it. Thought, I thought even with my therapist in Jerusalem, who helped me uh, move through facilitating and executing, getting you know, divorced and giving her a get. I thought if I would have told him the truth, he would have, and he was a psychiatrist, he's a psychiatrist, so he would have had the legal power. I, I thought he would have had me committed to a psychiatric ward, a hospital in Very Michelin. scary. 
It was very scary. That was part of my problem. Mm -hmm. It wasn't only the gender identity dysphoria. It was the age, the time period that I was suffering this without having any community that could support me. I, I couldn't um, talk with the rabbis. I definitely didn't trust the rabbis to talk about this with. I didn't even trust my therapist. I w I, you had no one. I, yeah, that's right. Very lonely. It was lonely. It was very, very lonely. Explain to us how you broke through that. What brings you to the point where, as scary as it is, you are going to acknowledge what you have always felt about yourself? When does that happen and why? You, you know, I know you read 50, but I want to know what happened? Yeah, what's, yeah, what happens in the journey that you're willing to take that leap? It's a leap of faith in some way. It wasn't so much the acknowledgement of how I was feeling. It was what I realized, finally, I need to do about it. So I had left, after the divorce, I had left Israel. I had left the Torah way of life. I had left my passion, which was to teach. And that was the one authentic, that, that was very authentic about me, that even though... I was, my students saw me teaching in the guise of a male. What I was teaching, I really believed in. I just believed there was no place for me in it. But that doesn't mean there'd be no place for you in it. And being a scholar and an academic person with feeling, like I mix both, the cerebral, the mind, and the heart. And I left teaching. I left Jerusalem. I left Jerusalem. I left Israel. And I, had, and I went down like the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. And it was a very dark period. And I really missed. I missed the Torah way of life. I missed Israel. I missed the spiritual. And At then, the time, you had become a very observant Jew. Well, when I left, yeah. Yes. Yeah, by that time, I was a leader in my community yes. in the world. And I was director of Chabad House. In the Chabad house. In it's the, amazing, you know? Yeah, it was amazing. And your, your father was involved also? No. Okay. No. My parents are both Jewish, and I was raised with some of the tradition, but not the observances. But getting back to answering your specific question, it's a very in, important moment and, and juncture in my life. For those 10 years from when I left Israel to when I made the decision on my 50th birthday, it was just getting darker and darker and darker, and I... I started really crying out to God for the first time and saying, I want to come back, but I can't come back the way I left. I have to come back. I know what I have to do. So I started to actually research. By then I was online. I had a computer. I started reading articles. I read about people who transitioned. And then I woke up on my 50th birthday, and that really was the, the worst and the best day of my life in terms of what preceded and what followed. It was the loneliest day of my life. I felt so disconnected from me and from the world around me. As I say, uh, as I've said before in other lectures and in my TED talk, I had no strength left anymore to continue breathing air into someone else's body while I was becoming lifeless. And that day is when I finally opened up my heart not my mind, not with text. I just literally got on my knees and wept and said to God, help me come back to you in truth. And that's when I began my transition. What did you do? The very first thing is I said I'm going to transition. Yes, but what does that mean? Well, what that what meant... What did you do? How does one transition, especially at that point with all of the baggage that had been loaded on you for 50 years. What is the first thing you did? I think, the, gosh, it was so, much, so long ago. Uh, I, I don't, I remember now the first thing I did. I was at a, I, I told people, I told people, you know, there's nothing like when you voice something in public, you feel more committed. Whom did you voice to? Well, I was, with a, I was with a few friends, and I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and one of the women got up and said, I have an announcement to make to all my friends that I invited over. There's something very important I want to say. I have come to realize that 
I am transgender and I'm going to transition into Mark. I'm, mo I'm moving from being born in a woman's yes. body. This was another person saying this in, in your presence. Yeah, yeah. I knew that was my jumping into the Yamsuf. You know, when God <laughs> said, and, and we learned that Nachshan ben Amida, he jumped in not knowing what would happen. He couldn't even swim and he jumped in. Yeah. I said, that's it. I stood up and I said, me too, <laughs> only we're going in the opposite direction. And I said, what, just, what, what did I just say? And this is what, who became Mark said, thank God, we've been waiting for you to say this. We all know that you're a woman. By the way, I am so happy for you. I am so happy for you. Yes. And I'm glad that that was a response. Yeah. And you write about this in your book, yeah. Bowen. But it's a very wonderful yeah. chapter, yes. And yeah, you're the right funny on. part about this is the strange irony is she got, when she became Mark, Mark got all my clothes. <laughs> what did I get from her? <laughs> Nothing, because she wore jeans all the time. <laughs> I said, there's something unfair about this transaction here. It's okay. If that was the worst unfairness, you yeah. did very, very yeah. well. Yeah. Yes. But okay. do you see, just being able to say yes. to someone else, to have that companionship we call in spiritual practice, spiritual companionship. Yes. To be able to encourage and support and hold the other and give space to the other. That for me was... How liberating must that have oh, felt? I felt I went from this aging old man to this young teenage woman. Yes. Like, in, like in a day. <laughs> like everything was new and fresh and it was just wonderful. Okay. And, yeah, it was liberating. Now, if we had all the time in the world, we would talk more about what that, how that journey is for a human being. Now you're going to have to read your book, and we'll do it maybe the next time you're here. Okay. I do want to know, however, as you begin to move more and more away from Jeff and towards Yiska. By the way, it's, you, you don't start with Yiska, correct? Well, it's, it's Jeff to Yaakov, back to Jeff, to Jessica. To, to Jessica. To Yiska. Okay. Um, how does the Jewish world react to you? Uh, as you know, as diverse as the Jewish world is, as much as many machlakot as there, as many different arguments in the Gemara. So I came back into the Jewish world with the uh, within the context of. I already knew not everyone would welcome me back with open arms and said, oh, Yiska, it's so nice to have you back. Although some did. Some didn't. Was that hurtful? No. 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 Well, Explain why. Because first of all, what, what I believe to have been a godly uh, driven and godly uh, led journey that's how I see my transition. When I came out on the other side, I was no longer afraid of anybody. As I'm sitting here with you, right now, nobody has anything over me anymore. Good. Because I hit, rock, I hit my spiritual rock bottom. And when you hit your rock bottom, whatever that means to the person, if you read different um, you know, blurbs about people who are in recovery, they can only go up. I could only go up spiritually. So, it didn't matter whether someone agreed with me or not. It didn't matter whether someone accepted me or not. It didn't matter whether someone understood me or not. I needed to do what I needed to do, and I want the viewers and yourself to really hear this. This was the essence of my whole transition. I needed to be right with God. Anybody else is gravy, is like the icing on the cake. But it was God that I said, for all those years, year after year after year, and knowing I was not being honest with God. Really, in a sense, not the God out there, the God inside of me, the divine spirit, the divine essence that I was, when we say, when you quoted earlier about created, each of us equally, no one no more, no one no less, but Selim Elohim in the image of God, to honor that to honor Rav Cook's teaching in his introduction to the commentary on the Haggadah. What does it mean to be a free person compared to a slave? A free person is a person who, no matter what, is faithful. He uses the word ne'eman, faithful to his inner essence, which is the tzelem elokim that he was created or she in. A slave, spiritually, in terms of a mindset, 
goes by the norms and expectations around the person, not being faithful to one's inner being. So I went from slavery to freedom, from abdut to chirut. So the fact that not everyone made a parade for me on Rechov Yafo in Yerushalayim, welcome home, I, I, actually if they did, I would think something was more wrong. Then I'd really worry. However, today as a mentor, as a spiritual mentor, where I work with a lot of individuals of all kinds of the, of the spectrum of, of Jewish, mostly Jews, a few non-Jewish people, but all different types of expressions of who they are, and I work with individuals. They're basically struggling with some degree of what you're... No, uh, no, no. And what? They're struggling to come out of their own closet. Whatever it is. Whatever, to it be more not, honest, to yeah. actually rub Cook's teaching is what I use to inform people about, are you being faithful to your inner being? Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. That's Jewish Authentic Living. Mm -hmm. That's my podcast series, Jewish Authentic Living with Yiska. Where I am now in my life, what concerns me if someone uh, speaks with hatred or uh, bigotry, discrimination, where it's meant to hurt, it doesn't hurt me what it causes me to, I pause and I say, what's going on for that person? It's not really about me. It's, I'm more concerned with that a person can be this way and speak this way in the name of Torah, using the Torah as a weapon rather than as a means to bring achdut, even when we're uncomfortable, even when we don't understand, even when other people are making choices that we would not. Can we hold space for each other? Surely, if we were created in the image of God, and God could hold space for us all, at least let's try. And going back to tikkun, that's what I mean by imperfect. We show, we manifest our imperfections by our fear, by our ignorance. So if someone were to voice or articulate hatred towards me or bitterness, or um, a discriminatory, cold-hearted, mean-spirited tone, I don't take it personally now. I, no, I'm concerned that the person would even think it's okay to speak this way to anybody, mm -hmm. to anybody, and that the person would identify me only through that small sliver of a whole tapestry, a whole complexity of humanity. Each one of us, is in, it says in the Gomorrah, an olam katan. Each one of us is a mini constellation of a whole universe. And to be identified through a one little sliver and then hate me for it. More damage, more hurt is being done towards the person that thinks it's okay than to me. I'm living my life. I'm living my dream. Mm -hmm. I'm back in Israel teaching spiritual Torah. I reconnected with some of my children, thank God. I have a beautiful garden. I go swimming. I practice Qigong. I travel all over the world. I mean, it's beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And I'm right with God now. And I do make mistakes. But now when I make a mistake in wanting to be close to God, it's because I want to be close to God. I'm not running away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You make a mistake. We all make we mistakes. We all do, yes. But I'm not making the mistakes in trying to live a life that's not true. It's mm -hmm. Dafka trying to live a life that is true. Yes. You are no longer living any lie. That's right. It doesn't mean you're perfect. So we're going to be. Well, again, I, and that's why, again, you and I are never going to agree on the word tikkun, <laughs> but I understand what you mean. It, yeah. it, it is profound. Um, I, I want to ask it slightly differently, only because I'm just curious. You were such a part of a mainstream Orthodox community. You were running Chabad. Has Chabad accepted you? Well, Chabad, how could I answer that question? I'll tell you how I could answer that question. <laughs> Authentically. Chabad is not a person. Chabad is... But you know what I mean. Well, I don't want to assume anything. So therefore, I'll answer specifically to what I think you mean. There are people who are very strong Chabadnikim, as we say in Israel, Lubavitchers, who totally embrace me in their lives. Fabulous. There are others who don't want to have anything to do with me. Okay. But that's not just Chabad. Yes. You know, I'll tell you, the world is very misinformed if they believe everyone in Jerusalem has a problem with me and everyone in Tel Aviv doesn't. Transphobia is not owned by any particular culture. Mm -hmm. There are 
non, non-observant, more to the left, more what we would say liberal, progressive people who are transphobic. There are the they have problems with you? Well, not me specifically. It's, it's, it's a, they have problems because that's, there's racism, there's ageism, there's, all, there's, there's um, misogyny. I mean, no one owns this. Just the way there are Haredim and Yerushalayim who embrace me, there are people in other parts of Israel or the world that are not so ultra-Orthodox that don't. And, and it's important we understand that if what we're doing, the choices we make, if it's to be right with ourselves, that, that at best is second. Okay. So now I want you to take a step out of you. Okay. Now I want, I want the academic now. I want somebody who is aware of the world in a, a, a rational, profound way. Okay. How do you think we, Western civilization, specifically America, the extent to which you know it, or even more specific, American Jewry, but in general, how is Western civilization now embracing everything that you are, and I don't mean you personally, to what extent do you feel that our society still has major problems with it? You know, there was the series on television, Transparent. There is a different mentality now. I believe a, a much healthier, more embracing mentality than when you and I were kids. At the same time, I'm not living the life you are. I want to hear... To what extent, where, you know, where, are we, where are we in terms of, as a society, being able to be comfortable with someone who says, I was born, I may have been born with certain genitalia, I'm a different gender. And your question is, how, how are, do I see How are we doing? Yes. You know, it's a, it's... It's not easy to answer that because the price that, uh, that our Western civilization or culture or Jewish communities are paying to be more open, there's, a, there's a, a price that it's hard for me to articulate this. It's hard because I don't want to be misunderstood. I know what, I, I, I know what the answer is. So try. I just want to be okay. careful. I don't, I'm not walking on eggshells. I just want to really express what I believe. The, the, the culture that I grew up in and the culture that I see now, the movement is towards a lack of commitment to a value system that we hold as sacred. My struggle was not with gender. I never struggled with my gender. It was with Jewish tradition. So. I couldn't have engaged in my transition if I didn't believe it was to be right with God. If it was just so I could have an easier life, it would have never worked the way it did with me. By society becoming less and less, and I do believe society, unfortunately, is becoming less and less committed to being part of a value system, of a morality, of ethics, that are really larger than any one of us, actually larger than the sum total of all of us. If that's what we're moving away from, so then just about almost anything is okay because we have no standard of what's right and what's wrong, of what's allowed and what's not allowed, then it breathes what I also see today happening, and this is the price, that there's a crisis. There's, I see there's a growing crisis. And it is growing of loneliness, of alienation, of disconnection in a world that claims to be okay with everything. There's, a, there's, something not, there's something not, it doesn't have a resonance for me because I don't believe under all conditions anything is always okay for everybody. So I, meet a, I know of a lot of people who have gone through a gender transition and are miserable. They're miserable people. They're self-absorbed. They're arrogant. They feel entitled. They feel victimized. And all I can do is I, I just feel so bad for them. 
I feel terrible for them because they've undergone such a major change. I don't know what each one of them expected, but it was not what I expected. Because I, and I'm just one person. This is, I'm just sharing. You asked me the question. That if you asked five other people, you'll get six opinions. When we give up being part of something bigger than ourselves, as, a, as an observant Jew, I don't say I'm Orthodox anymore. I say I'm post-denominational. I'm Shemeret Shabbat, Shemeret Kashrut. I'm Shemeret as much as I can of the Halakha. But I'm trying to be in a larger space rather than a smaller space to include more rather than less. I hold by values that have been transmitted for thousands of years. Yes, they change. Yes, there is an elasticity to it. I use the word uh, flexigidity. They're both flexible and rigid. It depends. We, you know, like a bridge that is built to deal with earthquakes, but it still is sturdy and strong. And that's what guides my life, not just, well, whatever it takes for me to just feel good. So it's not about just feeling good or wanting to join a bandwagon of sounding more open-hearted. Because when it comes down to it, when choices have to be made that are difficult, that's when you see what your values really are. And I'm not accusing anybody of anything. What I do see, though, is the growing crisis of loneliness, of alienation, of disconnection from self. So it can't be because everybody's just applauding everyone else's decisions to feel good. Mm -hmm. There's something else going on. And I believe, as one who's inherited, you know, we say that the Torah, the Morashaki let Yaakov, it's inheritance. Thank God I've in inherited a system of how to be in the world with myself, with you, with all expressions of God's creation, not only humans, Jews, non-Jews, but animals, birds, fish, the trees, the soil. I have a way. I have a model. I have a construct. I have a mizgeret. I have a framework. Does that mean it's always easy? No. Like you said, we're complex human beings, but it's okay. You say it so beautifully, Yiska. You know, in America, what I hear is that as a culture, as a society, we are much more sensitive to the other than we used to be. And that there is a, an attempt, there's a movement in America that, that tries to say it's important to be open to someone who was born one way and feels that they were another way. And then the issues that are in the news are what kind of bathrooms should there be and should there be, should men who were initially born men who feel that they're women and they become women, should they be in playing in sports with women who were never men? And that's an issue. And it's an issue, by the way, not only in America, it's an issue. Globally, you know, uh, you know, should should a trans? I don't. Should somebody who who was born a man and then becomes a woman should that person be playing tennis against other women? Should they be running in races against other women? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. It's not my world. It's not your world, is it? Yes, yeah, so I don't. I really. It's not only not my world, but because it's not my world, I don't feel competent. I don't feel, I just, I want to hold, I want to contribute to the dialogue, compassion. See, this is what the Jewish tradition can contribute to this. Rather than a judgment, to hold a dialogue, to be in a discussion, instead of pointing fingers and blame or not blame or allow or disallow, let's have a discussion a discussion that's characterized by compassion, by, by people that exemplify what it means to be created in the image of God. So I don't know. I don't know at all about someone who transitioned to how that person should compete. I have no idea. But it's surely worth a discussion. Isn't okay. it worth a discussion? Absolutely. Isn't it? Yeah. All right. But I can't let you go. <laughs> without you addressing the point you made in the book. <clears throat> and I just want you to just 
give me any answer you want to give me, where you talk about how you go to JTS, you're in the master's program of education. In Jewish education. And Jewish education. And a friend, and you've been to Israel as part of the JTS program. And you love studying Torah in Israel. And you feel somehow there's a connection for you to God through that. Yeah. And then a friend says to you at JTS, you understand you're never going to get that here. And the words you use is, in one it was a matter of soul, and the other it was a matter of cerebral calisthenics. The JTS was cerebral calisthenics, and that when you studied Torah in Jerusalem, it was something to do with the soul. Yeah, it fed my soul. It but awakened yes. my soul. Okay. So what does that say to you? And what can you, you know, what insight do you want to share with us about what that means about what Judaism is in the United States? And is there a difference when you study in Jerusalem? Or is it just that you were in a school in Jerusalem that was good for you? Yes, to all the above. <laughs> uh, what I thought then in my 20s about JTS, I've expanded now over the past 40 some odd years to include just about all, um, all different institutions, institutes, places of uh, Torah learning that are using the Western academic model which actually is Hellenistic. It, uh, it worships the human mind and the potential of the human mind to just keep expanding and expanding and expanding. And not that that's not beautiful. I mean, that's part of how we're creating the image of God. However, if it stays above the neck, there's very little room to sense God's presence there. So, yes, my initial experience at JTS, we're going back to the 1970s, I didn't feel the divine presence in the room that I did with their preparatory program. It was only about a six to eight week program in Jerusalem. In those, with those teachers who, you know, I don't, I, I guess they weren't employees of JTS, but somehow JTS hired them for this summer program, I felt the divine presence. But what I've come to understand, it's not only Dafka, Jerusalem, compared to Dafka, New York City. It's a mindset. There are places in the United States, like Reb Zalman's The Renewal Movement. There are alternative minyanim popping up all over now because the quest and the thirst and the hunger for spiritual presence is just growing. And people are no longer satisfied just to learn a daf of Gemara. They want to see what's mystical about it. They want to uncover the mystery of their soul through the Daf of Gomorrah. Not only cerebrally believe this is part of our tradition and the wisdom of God, but some, it, it shifts, it creates shifts inside of the, the terrain inside of one's own inner being. One is moved by it. So that can happen in Jerusalem, it could happen in New York, it could happen right in this room. It's a consciousness. It's an attitude of how we go about spiritualizing Talmud Torah. That's what I was really, I can say that now, I didn't know that then, but that's what I was seeking. I needed, and I was seeking the spiritual dimension of Talmud Torah, which I've discovered through the writings of not only Rav Cook, uh, but the great, the Piyasetzna Rebbe, Rabbi Kalman, Kalamanis Khan, Kalman Shapira, may his soul uh, rest in Aden, he was, he perished in the, in the Shoah. Actually, this is is his Yurtzeit. And he teaches to spiritual presence and spiritual practice. And he has a oh, section, many sections in the course of his seven books that discuss the spiritual experience of Talmud Torah, where you actually see you in the verse. You actually experience the verse. Like, I'm in the verse and the verse is in me. And that means I'm with God through the verse. It's not just I believe it in a logical, a cerebral, or theological. I, use, I like to use the word theological as compared to spiritual. You are fabulous. 
It's been, th it's been wonderful getting to know you. You've written a wonderful book. Thank you. Your voice is a very important voice now. I do believe On the that. world you were seeing. Yeah. You go from strength to strength. I mean. Kol tuva hatzlacha. Just promise me. Come here. This is not the last time you'll be at this table. Well, you know, right I, when I need you, I, ha I want you at this table. Okay. Fair enough? Well, I think that's definitely fair enough. But on, one t on, on the tonight of one, uh, of one very important Go ahead. Thing, you need to come to Jerusalem and interview I, me in my if home. I, if I'm in Jerusalem. Or Pardes, come if to Pardes. If I'm in Jerusalem, yeah. I expect an invitation. You have it. Okay, well, very good, darling. Yiska Smith, 40 years in the wilderness, my journey to authentic living. She's also in the film, I Was Not Born a Mistake, and you heard that's a title that came out of a program she did on JBS. You should make a point of seeing it whether you see it where it first comes out here in America. I am sure it'll be shown in many ways. Sooner or later it'll be on Netflix and Amazon. You'll be sure to see it. And as you can tell, uh, Yiska is one of the treasures right now of modern Jewish life. It was an honor to have her on L'chaim. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Thank you so much. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'chaim. Please. Email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And remember, you can now take L'Chaim with you on L'Chaim Podcast, anywhere you want to go. You want to listen to Yiska and me in this conversation again, you can go to the you know, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you download your podcasts and download the L'Chaim Podcast. Until the next time. I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.